All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Anand Kumar, and today's session is Leveraging Azure OpenAI for Intelligent uh, Content Solutions. Uh, the main question we're going to answer today is how do we integrate AI with Drupal to add value for our clients? First, a shout out to our sponsors and all the volunteers. Thank you so much for uh, your support. So uh, who are we? Uh, we work for American Institutes for Research. We're a not-for-profit institution. Um, and the core of our work is behavioral and social science research. Our work spans education, health, workforce, uh, human services, international development, and we work with federal, state, and local agencies, along with a number of various foundations. Oh, I'm a managing director and a chief solutions architect, and I've been with AIR for close to a decade. Um, also presenting will be Matt Decker, who's a principal applications architect, and Volodymyr Mostapaniuk, who's a senior software uh, developer. So here's our agenda. I'm going to speed through the areas on the left here. I'll talk about Azure OpenAI and why we selected uh, Microsoft as our vendor for Gen AI. Thank you. Uh, I'll also go through some use cases, challenges, and potential solutions. Uh, then Volodymyr is going to actually talk about some of the great AI work being done in our Drupal community already. Um, and after that, Matt's going to dive into the approach that we took for a secure prototype implementation um, that our federal clients would be happy with, especially when it comes to uh, data security and privacy. And finally, Matt will run through some screenshot demos, and we'll also have time to answer some uh, questions. So of all the large language models that are out there right now, and we've heard of quite a few, a lot of them, why do we select Microsoft Azure OpenAI? First of all, what is it? What is Azure OpenAI? Um, it's an AI model that we can access through REST APIs. Uh, there are models for generating text, like GPT-40. Uh, there are models for generating images, uh, like DAL-E. Whisper is used for transcribing and translation. Uh, and for using your own data, and this is kind of really interesting, there are embedding models that converts your content into what's known as vector embeddings. So with Azure OpenAI, what's really important is none of our data is used to train anything else or any other model. So what that means is our data is our own. It's not shared with Microsoft or any other third parties. Now, uh, I should point out that there is a human or a, a team of Microsoft staff that do look at our content in aggregate to make sure we're not doing anything um, illegal. Now, we work with quite a number of federal clients, and it's absolutely critical that we use and provide services that are covered under FedRAMP. Uh, Azure OpenAI last year was authorized under um, FedRAMP High for Azure Commercial. Another recent option that's under the same program is uh, AWS Bedrock that just came out a couple of, or at least it was authorized a few months ago. And so we're just starting to explore that. Um, now, besides private networking and uh, API endpoint availability across regions, we do have filters in place, and that's to manage content responsibly. So we have filters in place for severity thresholds and severity thresholds for things like violence and hate and self-harm, which automatically rejects any of the input that's coming in. So OpenAI is going to respond back and say, nope, this is kind of sounding weird we're not going to provide you an output. Um, OpenAI is not the only service um, under the Azure AI umbrella. There are a couple more that we've listed here that are uh, definitely worth checking out um, if you have time. So if you haven't seen the interface for Azure OpenAI Chat Playground, uh, this uses the underlying APIs. On the left here, 
uh, you can create what are known as system messages, and this is a way to inject your personality um, or inject a personality into the chatbot. This is also um, where you can provide your constraints and instructions. Um, on the right here is where you can specify uh, your various deployments. Like I said, there are a whole bunch of deployments that you can actually work with. These are different models. Right now, you will notice that it's, I don't know if you can see it, but it says GPT-35. That's a much older model. Um, and in the middle here is where you would type in your prompts for the chat session. And one other screenshot, uh, this is the interface for DALI, which, uh, which lets you generate images. Now, these screenshots are just meant to kind of show you what you can do without accessing the APIs directly. What Matt and Volodymyr are going to talk about is how to act, actually use those APIs to create your own applications. Uh, so next, I'm going to run through some use cases where generative AI can really make a significant impact in the work that we do, um, especially in the content management world. GPT-40 and uh, some of the older models do really, really well when it comes to generating or editing and refining content. Uh, the GPT models also do great with summarizing documents. That it lets you, it makes it easier to digest those documents, right? Who wants to read a 300 page PDF? Um, the latest models are also good for synthesizing. Uh, what that means is you can extract insights um, and trends. Let's say you have comments on your page, or you have op eds, or you have Twitter feeds, X feeds that are coming in. GPT models do really, really well with extracting overall sentiment. Now, as a research institute, it's important for us for, especially when it comes to findings and insights, to reach a really wide and diverse um, audience, which is why we're looking, we're actually not just looking at, but really interested in using AI for areas like dynamic content translation. So imagine you're on a page and you just need this in some other language, click a button and get that translation immediately. Well, you know, with, with a few seconds of lag. Um, we're also exploring auto-tagging uh, to, uh, and, and the main, so let's say you have massive amounts of content that's being ingested. Can you use auto-tagging to automatically tag it, right? Like, this is going to help with discovery and um, organization. We can also use these models to moderate user-generated content. So let's say we're running a website for students, and um, students are allowed to communicate with other students. Instead of purchasing really expensive software, what you can now do is have AI automatically review those posts and tag anything that sounds just a little bit off so that an administrator or really another educator can, can go ahead and review that and then, and then release it, right? And so um, we're, we're kind of interested in that technology. Um, content safety, essentially, right, and integrity is so much easier to implement now. Um, now, the quality in general of our content has to be pristine as a research institute, so we're asking AI to provide actionable recommendations. So we're asking questions like, here's my page, what can I do to make it better? How can I make it more readable? How can I make it more accessible? Uh, and 95% of the time, the results are uh, actually make sense. Uh, now, you know, you can't, you, you can't always trust it, but what we have found anecdotally is most of the time the answers that are coming back, the output is, um, is, 100, is, is not 100%, but 95, 90, 95 to 97% um, actionable. Now, a lot of our clients are also asking about dialogue systems. Can we let that end user, instead of typing in keywords, can they ask natural language questions? And um, can we return results that are both keyword powered, or keyword based and AI powered? Um, many of us think 508 first, especially in the federal space. Uh, we're using AI to help us incorporate accessibility. So whether it's auto transcribing videos, uh, audio, any kind of media, um, or translating. Um, 
or adapting our content dynamically based on user needs. So let's say you're a parent and uh, you see some content that's kind of interesting and you want to educate your kids and your son or daughter is in third grade. You know, how neat would it be to be able to click a button and say, uh, can you make this content readable or accessible to a third grader and have it convert based off of some of that criteria that you're um, setting up. And, and it works really well. In fact, I sometimes do that to learn new things, right? Um, if you have a chance to explore this, go ask uh, th th this particular prompt. Type in and say, hey, can you explain quantum mechanics or quantum computing uh, to me as if I were a third grader or a fifth grader or a sixth grader or uh, a college student? And you'll be amazed at the responses that are coming back. Um, Another piece that we're prototyping is user feedback analysis using AI. So we want to understand overall user sentiment. Uh, can we make informed decisions based off of what everyone is commenting in our particular uh, threads? And, and uh, AI does really well with creating semantic scores based off of uh, input. So uh, next I'm gonna talk about some challenges and solutions that you might face implementing AI in some of these use cases uh, and how we've approached this at AIR. Uh, we, we don't have it. We, we, it's not perfect, but these are steps that can help you get to a, a fairly stable um, point. You are going to run into accuracy issues and hallucinations, uh, so it's important to have controls in place. Every output for any application that you build, at least for now, has to have some kind of human review. You have to have a human in the loop. Um, another area to focus on is prompt tuning or prompt engineering, and that's making sure that what you're asking, the generative AI, has to be as detailed and specific as possible. Um, as I mentioned before, we actually created a team of humans to review every single output, verify the outputs. Uh, for working with our own data set, we're using something called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, uh, and that helps you take your own data sets that's not in the underlying large language model and query against it so that you're actually getting um, some decent results. There's something called knowledge graphs, which we're not gonna go into at all, but if you get a chance, start exploring that. What that's going to allow you to do is be, get more accurate with your, um, uh, with, with your results. Um, another major piece here is bias and ethical concerns, right? Um, you have to make sure that you're implementing guardrails. Uh, we are covered under Microsoft's customer copyright uh, commitment. So what that means is all of our outputs are not infringing on any intellectual property or copyrights. And so what that means is, um, I'd shown you Dali before, if we typed in clone McDonald's logo to create something else, it's gonna come back and say, you know, you are kind of treading on thin ice here, are you sure that's what you want? Right, and so it's all about that prompt. You have to make sure that you're using specific prompts to make sure that you are not infringing on, um, to, uh, on any kind of IP. We've also established uh, review boards to monitor and guide AI development. Uh, we have a code of ethics that we've um, uh, put into place. And I, I, arguably most important is because we're dealing with federal clients, we have meetings with our stakeholders to talk through the pros and cons of using AI, and we're being transparent about every single area that we're using it in. So whether it's coding, whether it's drafting a memo, we are being very clear that we used AI for um, these specific um, use cases. Uh, now in the research field, we focus quite a bit on data governance. Uh, with generative AI, there's even more scrutiny. So it's important to clearly define who has access and can work with what data and how it should be handled. Um, 
we need to be responsible data custodians. I think we are all aware of the emails that we're getting on our personal uh, emails saying, oh, you know, there's a breach. We're going to give you a year or two of uh, um, credit monitoring, right? Like, let's, you know, let, let's really be responsible about the data that we're um, inputting, even if it's um, uh, secure. Uh, it's also important to log everything. You have to monitor the feedback, monitor the feedback from users. So what that means is when you're getting this output, um, make sure there's a thumbs up or a thumbs down functionality where your users can actually type in and, and respond back with, you know what, this response really didn't make that much sense or the results aren't really doing too well so that you can go ahead and refine. Um, another item is large language, um, another important item is that large language models have learning cutoffs. So if you're expecting the latest information, uh, you need to add real-time data integration and data processing. So you're gonna have to use uh, APIs like Bing Search API, right, in order to get the latest results. Um, and last but not least, we need to understand and address the new types of vulnerabilities that are being introduced. Um, uh, with uh, generative AI technologies. And it's hard, like, because it, it's hard to stay informed because there's so much progress that's that's being made. It's rapid evolution every other week. There's something new that's coming out. And so um, it just, it, it's just important to, you know, subscribe to the, the latest uh, newsletters. Oh. And um, I'm gonna now, next hand it over to Volodymyr, who is our senior software developer. He's going to talk about the Drupal um, AI Community Initiative. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Anand, and thank you all for coming. So I'm Volodymyr Mostepanyuk, Senior Software Developer at American Institutes for Research. Uh, I have about nine uh, years of experience building a Drupal website, contribute back to Drupal, and enjoy to be part of this great community. Uh, I'm a little nervous, like I'm more technical person. Like, and uh, yesterday I asked Azure OpenAI like to give some advice. Since nothing works, so I will just continue. <laughs> yeah. So the rise of AI in Drupal. Uh, uh, right after official launch of uh, ChatGPT, the module for OpenAI ChatGPT integration became available, and it was great. Today there are over uh, 100 AI-related modules you can find on Drupal.org. And the main goal for, for me for today will be to show how you can use actually Azure OpenAI in Drupal, and I will start uh, to briefly explain and uh, show gener in general like what AI modules do we have in Drupal. From what I, uh, I have learned, there are these key modules to use AI in Drupal. Uh, OpenAI ChatGPT, Augmenter AI, and AI Interpolator. Uh, I, will, I want to ask a few questions. Um, do you know or had a chance to use OpenAI module? Okay, uh, who knows Augmenter AI? And what about AI Interpolator? Good. And I, I wanted to ask, I thought that it will be the main important question, but anybody is using any of these modules on production? Okay, good. Let's continue. So now let's uh, briefly learn about these modules. OpenAI Chat GPT integration. Uh, this module uh, allows, allows you to perform multiple text operations within the CK uh, Editor 5. You can generate text, rewrite, uh, it, summarize, <coughs> translate, adjust on, and much more. Additionally, it leverages other features like daily for uh, image uh, generation, embedding for, for search, has support for text to, to speech and speech to text operations. And Additionally, you can integrate uh, it with the ECA modules that is great for building some custom actions and workflows. Unfortunately, it's limited to OpenAI. And every API call, you will have to pay for it. And recently, this module was deprecated in favor of the AI module. No worries, I will 
explain a little more later. And uh, like it's intentionally AI module is not in the list on the slide on the previous slide. Uh, Augmenter AI, it's a powerful AI framework that allows uh, easy integrate multiple AI services. It's an it's a ecosystem of this module has about ten modules related modules that actually most of them are uh, integration with different AI service providers. So you have you got OpenAI, NLP Cloud, Google, AWS, and more. You can configure augmenters in the UI with predefined prompts, service-specific, model-specific configuration for desired results. And you can use multiple AI services or create multiple variations of these augmenter entities for single AI services. To use it, you usually add a field to content type uh, on, and configure widget for this field on the uh, entity uh, View form display. Um, in widget configuration, you usually choose source field that will be like the content from this field will be transferred to, to your prompt. And you usually choose a destination field where you will save your results. Uh, it's great. In the UI, you get a button in the form and you can place it near the related fields so you can use it and click it. Uh, Additionally, it also has a support for CK Editor 5, so you can, each augmenter you can uh, activate and use in the, uh, in the CK, edit, CK Editor 5. Uh, and AI Interpolator, it's another powerful module that uh, it actually more like support, like, more intent for knockout solutions and allows you to set up any AI workflow. It works with uh, at the same, it works with multiple AI services, and its ecosystem uh, is about 25 models, models that you can use. And similar to Augmenter, it transform, it, uh, you can transform and generate content across different fields. But the difference is that it's happening when you save the content. Okay, there is a great resource that maintainer of this module, like pull together and make multiple videos. And it's mind blowing what you can do currently with this module. You can go there and uh, see multiple great videos like about this. It's a workflow of AI.com. And similar, it was recently deprecated in favor of the AI module. There is much more. Uh, I'm not sure if you see, maybe somebody uh, knows this page. Uh, if you don't know, it's a great resource. It's a, a page where Drupal AI community collected all together all the AI related modules. If you need something, you can go there and see if, there is, if you can use something. But at the same time, there are some challenges, obvious challenges here that, yeah, challenges like duplication of contribution efforts. Uh, for site builders, for developers, it can be different to decide which model to use because sometimes modules like cover similar, same use cases. Uh, documentation is, can be also limited for some modules, and uh, not all modules have stable versions. And future maintenance of all these modules can be also a big challenge for the community. In press release from June 19, 2024, company Freely Give announced a new AI community initiative in Drupal. Our aim is to consolidate the best features of the contributed modules into a solid AI foundation for Drupal that provides a great out-of-the-box experience for site builders and make it easy to work with popular providers. And you can learn about this uh, initiative if you go to the uh, community project page. And even more, you can learn if you will uh, go to uh, issue queue and open issues. There are multiple interesting discussions happening there. And as you already know, OpenAI and AI Interpolator are deprecated. And uh, not just deprecated, based on these two modules, it was built a single solution with a nice namespace. It's AI module. So Drupal AI Mega Module. It has 
the new Drupal AI Mega module has a really solid implementation of the abstraction layer that uh, it, it, you can uh, use and swap um, various AI services as you want. Uh, most, if not all, the features from the OpenAI and AI interpolator are already there and you can use them. If you will enable AI Explorer submodule, you will get very powerful testing tool uh, that uh, allow, allow you to, 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 to make some very model-specific configuration, specific prompts, and see how your integration works. Uh, in the recent release from last week, they added uh, a, some AI search submodule that uh, uh, so now you can use a, you can, you can use a vector database as a search API backend and index your content and perform search like in, in that. Uh, there are also other nice features like one-click AI power trans translations and uh, text validation and much more you can find in each sub-module of this AI module. Uh, and of course there are some mentioning because that this initiative is preparing features for Starshot. And finally, it's time to share how you can use Azure OpenAI with these modules. And the most important question uh, uh, is can we use Azure OpenAI with AI module? Short answer, yes. Implementation of the AI provider is still in progress, but you can find the latest version in the issue fork. And uh, we at American Institutes for Research are working to get it finished to be included to one of the next release. Uh, at this moment, it was success successfully tested for any chat, text-related operations, uh, and for image generation. Uh, additionally, Azure OpenAI can be used with the Outminder module as well. Uh, you just need to install additional module called Azure OpenAI Augmenter. Uh, when we found this module, it had, uh, it had support only for completion operations, so we also contributed and enhanced it a bit to support chat operation. And it's already released, uh, so you can find it in the latest version of the module. And of course, there is no need to contribute to, to Azure OpenAI uh, or ChatGPT as they are already, uh, Azure, sorry. There is no need to contribute to OpenAI, ChatGPT, or AI Interpolator because they are deprecated already. And so, to get involved, just try out and test the Drupal AI module. Uh, it's uh, the place to get started and help with testing Azure OpenAI provider. Uh, you can, as the next steps, build a, uh, innovative solutions like in your project. If you will get some challenges or ideas, contribute back by writing code, by writing tests, uh, participate in discussions, like, or just even bring your innovative ideas. All is appreciated. And uh, you can join uh, Drupal AI Slack channel for, uh, to, see, to follow the communication, or to stay informed, you can subscribe to the Drupal AI community newsletter. Uh, you can find the link uh, on the community initiative page. And uh, yeah, it will be upcoming event in Drupal Camp, uh, Drupal Camp AI in London. Probably not all of the, not many can go there, but uh, you can watch recording of favorite sessions. So it's, it's great. And now I'm going to hand it over to Matt, who is the principal application architect. And uh, yeah, he will do a screenshot demo of Azure OpenAI solution. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. So I'm Matt Decker. I'm a principal applications architect at AIR. I've been there 14 years. Uh, love every minute of it. And today I get to do a demo of implementing AI and Drupal. All right, so some of the goals of this demo are going to be using Azure OpenAI, which we've spoken about a bunch today. We're going to build our own Azure OpenAI powered module. We're going to build the service associated with it. Uh, the current Azure OpenAI is not ready to go yet, so we're going to roll our own. And it's going to be real quick. It's actually very simple to implement. We're going to utilize the existing OpenAI PHP connector 
It works great. There's no reason to write it ourselves. And we're going to extend a current module that uses ChatGPT. So we're going to instead use uh, Azure OpenAI. OK, so the first few bullets here are going to be the setup. It is a standard Drupal 10 installation managed by a composer. We're also going to be requiring the OpenAI PHP client. And we're going to install Drupal OpenAI summary from drupalcode.org. There is not a release available yet for that module. So you have to go to drupalcode.org to grab it. And the reason we're using that one is because it's only about 200 lines of code. It's very simple to implement. So you can look at it and really sort of understand, OK, this is how I use it. So if you have your own use case where you want to implement uh, Azure OpenAI in your project, you can do that. The last two down here are the Azure OpenAI service. So that's going to be a custom module that we're going to write. It's actually very small. And then we're going to connect OpenAI summary to that service that we spin up. All right. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. And then after you see what it looks like, I'm going to show you the implementation and the code. There will be a QR code at the very end of this where you can grab this code and use it yourself. All right. So this here is the standard create a basic page. And you should note one very big difference is we now have a open AI summary button right at the bottom. So once you enable the module, you will see this button. OK, so I go in, I write myself a title, I write my body that's extremely long. This is several paragraphs summarizing a relatively popular movie that you may or may not have seen. And we then finish our content. We then click our button, Open AI Summary. And after about two or three seconds, you get a response. And then we have a summary. And we can see that the summary there is pretty short. And it's pretty well written. Uh, as Anand had mentioned earlier, make sure to review it. You know, nothing you get from OpenAI uh, should just be put into production without reviewing it first. So make sure to review the content that you get back. All right, now let's get into the code a little bit here. So this is, and I'm going to zoom in on this here. So over here, this is our Azure OpenAI custom module. You see there's literally just three files here. We've got our info file to say, hey, this thing's a module. We have our services file to say, OK, we're going to provide a service that Drupal can use. And then we have our Azure OpenAI service PHP file that actually just has two methods in it plus our getters and setters. So this is our first method we're going to talk through, and that's set client. Basically, we just get a couple variables from a secrets file. Do not save your API keys and things into your Git repository. Put them in a secrets file somewhere, and then pull them in. And this is leveraging that OpenAI project that we pulled in. It just does a very simple factory method and sets up the client for us. And then further down, in that same exact file, we have a request. And so this request method takes a string, goes through our client, and returns a response. And so you can see here that this is completely input agnostic. It's not saying, give me a summary, give me a body, summarize this. It's not saying any of that. So you could theoretically pass anything to the service that's text-based and get a text-based response. OK. All right. So now this is stepping into the OpenAI summary module. And I will zoom in here because it's a little hard to see. We will see on line 34 
that they are using the OpenAI summary, which is ChatGPT. We commented that out and instead connected it to our Azure OpenAI service. So this is staying inside Azure OpenAI instead of reaching out to ChatGPT. Now we talked about prompt engineering a little bit. We did add a prompt to the beginning of this and it says write a summary with a maximum of 100 words using plain language with no markup of the following. And then we append our body to it. And the reason we did that was because we said, well, this is going to generate a summary. We need to tell the service what it is we want. We want a summary. And it sounds very verbose, write a summary, 100 words, plain language. It sounds very tedious. But if you don't have that, the response you get is going to be really weird. It's going to have a lot of bullets. It's going to be really long. So you have to make sure to have a really good prompt. And it's going to take you some time to get a good response. All right. So that was the summary module. And this is another example of something you could do with this module. And so we added at the bottom, check content for publishing, which basically means make sure we're using plain language. Make sure we're not uh, using harmful language or inappropriate language, checking the grade level of what we've written. So this is just one more implementation where we said, OK, take this body, pass it into AI with a couple prompts, and re reply with that. Now, Anand had presented earlier all of the other use cases. So I encourage you to go back to the slides and look at the very beginning and look at all those other options. But that sort of shows you some other things that you can do with this. And that is the completion of the demo. And I encourage my other presenters to come up. And if you have any questions, we're available. Yes? I'm curious which model you were using for sentiment analysis. It's, it's all using the oh. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is, uh, what model are we using for sentiment analysis? And it's GPT-4.0, the latest. It's actually not the latest model. There is a, there's a newer version. But as of two weeks ago, it was GPT-4.0. Do you fine-tune at all? We do not fine tune at this stage, no. no. Um, and, and, and it's actually a really interesting question. You know, should we, the question is, should we fine tune or do we fine tune? And the answer is we currently don't fine tune. In fact, we find um, what's known as few shot learning works a little bit better, or, uh, and few shot learning is we're taking, we're, we're defining our prompts as detailed as possible, and we're providing our prompts examples in order to provide us the results that we're expecting. But the other piece that we're using is, we briefly mentioned RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, and we're using that technique along with the knowledge graphs to return an output first, and then pass that output into OpenAI to come back with um, what we think are much more accurate responses. If I can ask, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you uh, so in your prompt to the to for to the AI, do you at all do any priming or saying you are you know that you are a you know analyzing for sentiment or something like that to mirror down what the AI is going to be looking for? Yeah, and and so the, to repeat the question, um, you know, do are we doing anything with the actual question or as the question gets passed in? Uh, from a refining standpoint, and the answer absolutely is yes. Um, we are using system messages to, to not only inject that personality that I talked about before, but to actually add the specific instructions and uh, prime the model. And so here's what an example might look like. If we're thinking about sentiment analysis, we're going to start with the following. We're going to say, uh, and let's say we're, we're bringing in uh, Twitter uh, X feeds. We're going to start with the following prompt, for example. We're going to say, um, we, we are importing X feeds. We would like a sentiment score based off of this criteria, and the criteria would have scores from 0 to 5 or 0 to 10, however we feel we wish to define it. And then for each score, we might say what a 0 means is the following. 
what a five means is the following, and we, we try to be as detailed as possible. But yes, that we 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 have sometimes a thousand, two thousand word or token um, uh, priming uh, statements, system messages. Yeah. Could you just describe a little bit more about your knowledge graph? Is that Implemented in Drupal or the service? Yeah, and, and so knowledge graphs, we started exploring now. We read about knowledge graphs about a year ago, and we started implementing it just a couple of months ago, and our data scientists are super interested in this. Uh, what we're doing is, so with the RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation um, uh, use cases, what we found is that we could take our data set, no matter how large it is, convert them into vector representations. So these are numbers. You know, th think about like an X, Y, Z, but with 1,600 dimensions, right? And so what we're going to find is that we could get back some pretty decent results. But in order to make those results even better, we need to add context. And knowledge graphs allow us to add that context. So now, if we're asking a prompt and we're asking a question like, oh, um, how did Apple do this last quarter? Without knowledge graphs, what we were finding is that it would come back with a bunch of different documents that talked about maybe Apple trees, along with the Apple company, but now you start adding knowledge graphs to it and it's actually understanding the context because that knowledge graph is specifically saying this document that we ingested has to do with this metadata which has to do with, um, it, it, we would have some taxonomies, right, related to it. And so it's actually converting our input into these vector representations but during that process, there is context being added. And that's why knowledge graphs are so phenomenal, because it's allowing us to, um, to, to essentially find exactly what we are asking about, rather than coming back with random information. Yeah? Knowledge graphs are a pretty old technique. I yeah. mean, think early expert systems and prologue. That's, I mean, that's, 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 that's what right. they were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. Sure. I have a question, uh, not exactly Drupal related, but more AI model related. So you said it's a private networking. That means that your data is not going to share with the rest of uh, Azure uh, data model? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So with Azure OpenAI, the guarantee that you're getting when you, when you, you know, set up this enterprise level uh, agreement with Microsoft is that the model that you're using, it is the underlying open AI. So the, the company open AI, it's their chat GPT models. However, it's not being used to train anything else. It's, you can think of it as our own private model, right? Where, where all that data just stays within the AI or Microsoft boundaries. So you sign that NDA with Microsoft, and that data is not escaping that, that box. All right. Any other questions? And you pay for that model. What's that? Microsoft. You pay. Yes. 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 And, and, and the reason for that, so we're, for, from an AIR perspective and from a Drupal community perspective, right, we are all about open source. We want to use open source models. But our federal clients are not that happy with that, right? They, they want to know what kind of controls do you have in place. Um, they want to make sure that any data that the public is entering, any data that the federal government or state government or local agencies are entering, is that's protected. And you can't find that guarantee outside of Microsoft or um, AWS Bedrock, right? Those are the only ones that are approved currently. And so we're kind of constrained in what we can do. But we, we would love to use the open source models because, we, you know, we're, we love open source. We're all about open source. We just, some of our clients just don't allow us to do that. Yeah. In my previous question about um, sentiment analysis, you yes. mentioned RAG. What are you using RAG for in relation to sentiment analysis? Or how are you using it? Yeah. So in some instances, we may already have a database of um, 
uh, tweets or data that that humans have already reviewed and provided a ranking for. Uh -huh. And so we want to make sure that that's included. Now, one way to do that is that few shot learning where we just take all that information, plop it right into the prompt itself, but sometimes we go over the uh, token limits, right? And yeah. so for, for that reason, we have to first vectorize it uh, and then query against that. So do you find, I think it's like the 32,000 token context window, do you, find, do you find that that limits you, or is it more now? I, I haven't kept it up. was a year ago it did, it's now 128,000 tokens, yeah. and, and now the latest models have even increased the output. Uh, so it used to be a 4,096 yeah, output, but now they just, in the last two weeks, they just expanded it, I think, by four. I think 16,000 is now what the output is. But um, I, I think input's still 128K. Uh, I believe, uh, I chatted with someone at Microsoft and they said, yeah, that's not really a limit, uh, as long as you're willing to pay. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. So we may not need to, but I mean, you know, something that we talked about before is um, ethics. Just because we have access to 128,000 tokens, should we be doing that? Like, what does that mean for the climate? What does that What does that mean overall? Are we really supposed to be like just being careless with with this? Right? Shouldn't we really try to be as efficient as possible? Right? And and, and those are the kind of things that there are uh, boards at AIR working groups that are kind of trying to figure all that out. Did your demo, uh, or any of the modules that you demo, did that have that user-generated feedback? Like, if the AI model is generating a summary, do you have the ability in Drupal to, like, plus up or plus down, or minus that, uh, that summary and, and provide feedback to the model from Drupal? No, it is only one way currently, but I don't know if Interpolator has options for that. I'm sure that we could add that, but that was just a basic, simple demo. Um, it's not baked into that, unfortunately. Yeah. We can do that with uh, AI automators and AI models. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.